Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session of uh, Maker a Day. Uh, I have uh, uh, I'm Vicky. For those who don't know, from Double Maker, and Jeffrey's here from Double Maker as well. Uh, for those who don't know what Double Maker is about, we run annual Maker Festival every single year here in Dublin. Uh, unfortunately, this year we had to postpone uh, due to COVID uh, to next summer. And but we miss our makers so much. Uh, so we want to bring some of our makers um, through these virtual events, these maker days to um, uh, give workshops and talks and demos. And today we have uh, crafty Nathan Creations, Nathan Wheeler. Uh, so hey guys. <laughs> so uh, well, so we're live streaming today. So um, and we're going to show a video, uh, but Nathan will be here um, all the time and he'll have queuing it afterwards, but he, he'll be on live chat as well and we'll be on live chat. So if you have any questions, please post it. And um, if we can't answer all the questions um, during the video, we can answer right at the end as well. So um, welcome everyone again. Um, I'll hand you, though, hand you over to Nathan to give a quick, you know, quick banter and then we'll start your Perfect. workshop. Thanks so much, Vicky. Um, so I guess my background really is I started in cosplay props. I liked to build massive suits of armor. I built a Nuka-Cola armor. I'm working on a massive tech priest. I built some stuff in the Metro games. And that's really where I got my start in kind of the really making world. Um, COVID has kind of changed the world a little bit. And I've kind of had to retreat back to my apartment and can only do stuff in my apartment. So what I'm working on now at the moment is an awful lot more small scale dioramas. So I'm trying to replicate reality as much as possible. I've done a little bit of military stuff, but this diorama was based upon my favorite poem, uh, The Road Not Taken by Robert Frost. And I wanted to show something simple, something enjoyable, and something that we can all sit back and just relax with and really enjoy the act of making. Not everyone will be into model making. Not everyone will. Some people might be intimidated by the, the scale of it and kind of all the different parts of it. But if you have any experience with model making and you have any experience in making a scene or creating something, it might be an enjoyable way just to sit back and relax. So I suggest you grab a cup of tea and enjoy the video. Hello, Science Week. My name is Nathan Weir from Crafty Nathan's Creations, and I'm here today to show you how to make this little diorama from simple supplies you can find around the house, maybe if you go out for a walk, and a lot of stuff you can get in your local hobby store. Let's get straight into it. To start this diorama, I started off by getting together all the tools I would need and devising a plan of what it would look like. My idea for this diorama was based on a poem by Robert Frost, The Road Less Travelled. I wanted to replicate the feeling of walking through a dark forest, a break in the road, autumn leaves around, and a signpost pointing in two different directions, with a man and his dog taking their time and walking through. When you're doing projects like this, one of the most important things you can deal with is scale. You've got to make sure that every single part of it is matching up with every other single part. If things don't look correct and they don't match up, the brain will tell you this doesn't work. This is a well-known problem in the model making community where things just don't look right. And if you do it perfectly, no one will notice and that makes all the difference. I tried to flesh out where I'd put my trees, how I wanted it to look, what kind of parts I would need, putting everything to scale and breaking down each and every piece. It's important to do this early on. If you break it down and you don't have a full on plan, you can really go astray further on in the project. It's so important to get this right, right from the beginning. After taking some calculations and using a scale calculator, I realized exactly what every height had to be and I was able to get started cutting and working the foam. Insulation foam has been a mainstay in the model making community for generations. It's so versatile, it's so useful, you can do anything with it as long as you work it right. First step was to get our knives ready get our Sharpie, get our ruler, and get started designing what we wanted to make. First off, pull off all the aluminium foil. You don't need it, but it is the most satisfying thing you will ever do, ever. There is nothing better than this, I promise you.
measuring out our 20 by 20 grid. We want to have this all down here on the foam so we don't forget. Make sure you measure twice, cut once. That's the most important thing. Make sure you use a sharp hobby knife. You do not want to use a blunt knife. Do repeated and shallow cuts. You, it should take you a few times before you get through. It'll give you a much cleaner cut and a much straighter cut. Trust me on this one. Now let's take our design and we're going to transfer it from paper onto the foam so we know exactly where all our different parts are going to be. Here I'm using a Sharpie, best thing to do for this kind of project. You don't need to be too accurate. We're just roughly blocking in where the different components are going to be. When you're starting off, it's sometimes better just to go freehand and go with what you want to think to do. But when you're doing a project like this, it's sometimes good to stick with the plan for now until things get interesting. Sometimes you want to go off the beaten track and try something completely different. Now that I have my design on my foam, I need to cut out the side panels. These are going to make up the two embankments on either side. Again, I mark it in and get it ready for cutting. Using a sharp blade, you cut right through. And now we have our two pieces. Let's start sculpting the two embankment sides. You don't need to be super accurate here, you're sculpting. Let the sharp knife do the work and make the embankment the way you want to do it. The way I worked on it was trying to make sure it looked like it was flowing through the valley. We wanted to not have them up too high and rocky, but have natural earth mounds. Take your time on this project. Stuff like this, if you muck it up, it can really have long-term down the line problems. So try and get it right, but make sure you don't leave any straight lines. There's nothing in nature that's straight and that's what we have to ensure here. Also, make sure you use a sharp blade. If you use a dull blade, you can really, really hurt yourself. Using knives such as this, you can have a really bad time if you're hacking away. You need to slice right through these things. And now we're gonna try a little test fit. Make sure it all works and we have a nice gentle slope. As you can see, I've left a little bit out. I cut too much and I didn't realize, but don't worry, we'll figure that out soon. Sculpting like this can be really, really fun. It's really nice just to be able to slowly chip away at something until you have exactly what you're looking for. Time for a test fit with our minifigure. It's looking pretty good.
we'll take them away for now. We've got plenty more work to do on them later. I decided I want to have a ditch here. So I marked it out and got ready to start cutting. I was very careful not to go too deep on this. I want a ditch, not a trench. And when you're working at a good scale, you can make that distinction very, very quickly if you're not careful. Little cuts over and over, make sure that you're getting your scale right. After that test fit, I take a wire brush and I start to rub down all the parts that are gonna be glued together. This makes sure that we have a much stronger bond. Anytime you're using an adhesive for whatever you're doing, it's always important to basically roughen up each side of it so it sticks together much stronger. You can use this in any aspect of making, but for this, it works an absolute treat. Roughen up, then apply adhesive. I do the same to the base. Then with some Mod Podge, a great all round glue, we start to stick the two pieces together. A nice clean coat and it should stick within the next hour. Apply firm pressure here to make sure you get a strong bond. Also make sure that your top layer and your bottom layer match up on the outside. If not, you'll have overhangs and it becomes a nightmare to cut later. A little bit of glue on either side just to make sure it stays down. If you're using glue on a brush, you want to use a bit of brush cleaner. Clean it up, get it out, and really it'll keep that brush living a long life. I cannot recommend this enough. Sculptor mold is a type of plaster. We're going to use that to even out all the foam putting it as a top layer. It'll be the perfect thing to really set this diorama off. Using a two to one ratio of two parts sculpted mold and one part H2O, we'll get the perfect consistency to cover our diorama. though I promise I didn't do this on purpose. Sculptor Mold just didn't like me, unfortunately. Make sure to bag this up and keep it safe. We don't want any air getting in there and drying it out. So let's mix it up. Nice and softly, we want a little bit of water, a little bit of Sculptor Mold. If you put in too much water, it'll be far too watery and it will take days to dry. This is a serious concern. Less water is better. Get it together so it's a nice paste and then we'll start adding it onto the diorama. You want to try and work this in with your fingers, getting maximum coverage and it'll dry pretty quickly. So you've got to work fast.
as it starts to dry out, you can shape it an awful lot more. Getting those gradients in, getting a really good textured effect. This is probably one of the most fun parts of the diorama making. It's great to see some pieces of foam when you start slapping on the plaster and really brings it on to the next level. Keep working it until you're happy or until it's fully dried out. Now do your best to try and wash your hands. This stuff is a nightmare to get off. It's still a bit wet, we'll come back to this later. Next up, we're gonna design our sign post. Again, a little bit of a design, then we're gonna get our scale right. We wanna make sure we get this right. We're gonna make this from scratch. Matching it up with our figure, we'll get the scale perfect. Taking some barbecue sticks, we're gonna cut it to length and mark this with a Sharpie. While I initially tried to use the knife, this turned out not to be as successful as I thought it would, and eventually I had to go and use the snips. Use a little bit of sandpaper to even everything out. We don't want any ragged edges on this. We can roughen up the sides, give it a bit of a wood technique with the knife. Taking an aluminum can, we're gonna cut out our signposts. Be very careful when you're cutting aluminium. It can be very, very sharp and you can cut yourself very easily. Once they're ready, we can attach them right to our signpost. Do so, we'll use a little bit of glue and attach it with some tweezers. Yes, this is the most finicky thing you could ever do. Next, we'll use a little bit of texture paint to kind of break up the silhouette of the wood. Just a little bit on each signpost and a little bit at the bottom to give it some more texture. As a final step, I found a little bead and I attached it right to the top to round the whole thing off. And there we are. Dry it out with the heat gun for a little while longer. Then using some acrylic paint, we are gonna paint the whole diorama. What we're trying to do here is block off all the white. We don't want to have to be shining through when we start to put on the soil. Just put down one or two thick coats. I then used brighter color give it a little bit of depth.
The next step, we're going to cover the whole diorama in actual soil. This is real soil that's been sifted and baked. Nothing quite matches soil than actual real soil. We're going to lay down a layer of Mod Podge and then sprinkle the soil right on top of the diorama through a stocking to get a kind of dust effect. We don't want big, large particles. We want thin, easy coverage to match the scale. Try and get all the nooks and cracks. We don't want to leave any of the paint underneath showing. This is starting to look good. Next, spray the whole thing down with scenic glue. We don't want that dirt going anywhere. Make sure to wipe up any of the big pools and apply more dirt as you see fit. Next, we'll apply some thicker dirt much more coarse this time to try and break up the dirt outline. Next we're going to add some pebbles. These are actual real pebbles. We're just going to use some super glue and then use an activator to speed up the drying process. Making the trees is a simple process. Cut the balsa wood to your predefined lengths. I then attached a pin right to the bottom just so it would make the tree stand up straight when it's in the foam. A little bit of glue to secure it. I then gave the trees a little bit better bark effect, narrowing them at the very, very top, just so they more resemble bark. All my trees are starting to come together. Taking some craft wire, started getting ready to attach all the branches. I had to make literally hundreds of these and then drive them into the balsa wood with a set of pliers. This takes a while, so if you're working on something like this, put on some music because it will take quite a while. Use a little bit of glue to hold it all together. Then to shape it and give it that tree effect, I took a set of snips and I slowly cut them. Shorter at the top, much broader at the bottom with a little bit of super glue to hold everything together. And then we had the start of our forest. Next up, we need to make the flags. So when you're making a large diorama, one of the big issues you can have is you don't want to put your trees on straight away, especially if you're not going to put on static grass. So we create little flags that will sit in place of the trees. We number the flag, we number the tree, and then we know where each one will go. So now it's time for a test fit. Let's see what tree we want to put where. This can be a really fun part because you're always wondering how you want it to look. So take your time at this point. Play around with it. Maybe you'll find a tree is better here or that tree is better over there. That's half the fun of it. You want to see what, how it's going to look. This was starting to really come together. And once I had it all ready, I then swapped out my trees for my flags before we move on to static grass. When we start with the static grass, we're going to apply a small amount of mod podge all the way around, leaving plenty of room around the trees. There's not going to be any grass growing underneath the trees. Then we take the static grass through our static grass generator. Here I use dark green and a lighter green and put them in the static grass generator. This creates a static field that basically makes the grass stand up on end and is a great modeling resource that you can find in most big hobby stores.
Using a set of tweezers, I make sure that errant pieces of grass are kept up. That or I'm just manicuring the grass. I don't know at this stage. Now we work on the other side. The static grass generator can really offer a whole different world when it comes to model making. You can get into really, really narrow areas and just create the most beautiful grasslands. Matched with the dirt, it really brings stuff, stuff out to be next level. Just had to move the flag there because I could not get to it otherwise. Make sure to remind me to put it back. And then some more mana green. You can always recycle this. Now we're going to apply a brighter form of static grass, a dark burned grass. We apply this in little areas so not to overpower the green. This makes it much more natural, a vibrant amount of colour rather than just one or two layers. You can suck up all the excess static grass with a hoover and a stocking. This has the added bonus of collecting it all so you can use it again. We use some more scenic glue to make sure it all holds together. It's going to take a while for this to dry. Then we attach sea foam twigs. We drive them into the soil with a little bit of glue and it really brings out an incredible root effect. This was a really, really fun part of the build and I think it really adds to This is a perfect time to use a set of tweezers, but I also wanted to make sure that the path was clear of static grass and we had a good foundation to work on later on. Sometimes I tried to hide the little bit of roots hidden away under the rock. Little details that you guys probably won't see, but I'll get to notice. Now it's time to add the path. We use Vallejo air paints and an airbrush to get this effect. Using a little bit of khaki, we add it to the airbrush and we're gonna lightly dust a coat for the path. While potentially you could use weathering powders, in this case I thought the airbrush was the best choice. Make sure before you use your airbrush, to practice on a little piece of paper to make sure it's feeding correctly. When using an airbrush, it's always important to do light controlled coats. You do too hard, it can really, really mess up what you're working on. And always make sure to clean it afterwards to improve the longevity. And there's the path. Using the leaves, I actually got real leaves, ground them up and baked them. There's nothing that really adds that realism like these real leaves. Two batches, autumn leaves and more kind of summer leaves. And I sprinkled these on, on a layer of Mod Podge. Careful to spread out where I put the leaves. I didn't want them everywhere. I wanted them pushed into the corners as it would be as people are walking up and down the road. What makes these leaves so convincing is that there's such a variance of color. And oftentimes in bills, if you have a very mono color, it doesn't look right. Nature is vibrant, it's alive, it's teeming with excitement. You need to add that in in your colors when you're working on dioramas. I then added a little bit of the green leaves to kind of break up that, show the transition from summer to autumn. Again, these are just sprinkled on with a little bit of Mod Podge. Make sure you get all the little areas where leaves would have accumulated. And then clean the path off, making sure to get rid of any excess leaves and any static grass still remaining. Around the trees is also a perfect place to add a little bit of cover. Hold all this together with a bit of scenic glue. I added a couple more leaves for the fun of it. Next up, we're going to make our mile marker. 
I made this using a matchstick. We then got the shape of the matchstick with a little bit of a knife and some sandpaper to get a triangular point. This triangular point surprisingly was one of the more difficult parts of this project and took me a couple of tries. You can see here, I got it right in the end. I then attached a little bit of craft wire to the bottom with some super glue so it would sit in the foam and will be able to be attached to the diorama easily. Use a bit of activator to speed up the drying of the glue. And then with a dark grey, you then sprayed it with the airbrush. We followed this up with an oil paint wash. Black oil paint, a little bit of linseed oil mixed together, really thinned down, and it basically gives a great weathered effect. Now it's time to work on our trees. First, I airbrushed it with some dark earth. I followed this up with a mahogany color to give that tree real life. Once this was ready, it was time to flock the trunk. Using a bit of Mod Podge, we then used Woodland Scenic's fine turf to bring out the bark. This was just lightly sprinkled on with a couple of coats and really, really changed the look of the tree. I left a few bits uncovered so you could see the under layer of paint shining through. Next up, we flocked it with some wild grass from Knock in the static generator. Take your tree, take a little bit of Mod Podge and apply it to the branches, making sure to get underneath as well so we get full coverage when we hit it with the static generator. The static generator really, really adds life to it really, really quickly. Make sure to get underneath as well. We want to make sure that all the static grass is focusing down as opposed to up. You can always recycle the stuff that doesn't stick. We can darken down the tree now with the airbrush. For this tree, I wanted it to stay dead, so I really darkened it down with plenty of blacks and plenty of browns. I made sure to keep all the branches pointing down to have that natural slope. When you're working on stuff to make it as realistic as possible, you need to imagine how would nature react to this? What would it look like? I often use plenty of sample pictures to judge how my work is going. Now our forest is starting to work, but we have one more round of flocking to do. I apply some scenic glue to the trees and then apply the static grass right on top and then flip it and apply it to the bottom. I mix the grasses here using plenty of light and plenty of dark. Next, we paint the signpost. Now, let's paint our signpost with the airbrush. Light, easy coats. Then, simple wash with the black ink. We want to try and weather this, break down those tough colours and offer a little bit of green, a little bit of dirt and grime to make it seem like it belongs in the world. 
You can rub off your mistakes. I do. I designed the signs on the computer, then printed them out, and then attached them painstakingly with the tweezers and an awful lot of patience. I don't want to say how long this took, but it took absolutely ages and was a nightmare. Now we have our trees, we have our signposts, and we have our mileposts. We're ready to assemble. Luckily we put those flags in. We attach the signpost with a little bit of glue and push it in with some pressure. Then for the milestone, we add a little bit of glue and we push it into place. I use some super glue and a bit of activator. Pull out your flags, a little bit of glue and attach your trees. Some of them won't stick so you're going to have to use a little bit of super glue and some activator. These took a while to glue down. These trees are big, they're somewhat heavy and they're a little bit lopsided. Some of them by design are very lopsided so they took plenty of glue and I had to hold them for a little while longer. In this instance a couple of leaves will cover that up pretty easily. Just make sure you have them pointing in the right direction. The last tree goes in. For the sides, I used a black acrylic paint and I just covered it up with two to three coats. Finally, we move on to the figures. Every model is going to have a little bit of issues from when it was made, so sometimes you just need to use a little file and take off the worst of it. The dog had it an awful lot worse than other things, but he pulled through and worked hard. Painting a figure can be quite complicated. There's different ways of doing it and I don't want to go into too much detail here. But you can go very, very complicated, get into complex situations where you're using a paintbrush and wet blending, and it can take hours and hours and hours to do even one small piece. For this project, I did this quick and dirty. I didn't put masses amount of hours into it. I used the airbrush for the main part of it, and then I hand painted the main features. Not a huge amount of effort involved in this, but it came out pretty nice. I was really happy with how the jacket turned out using those reds and browns. Sometimes when you start on some of these projects, you're thinking, I don't know how this is going to be, and it can turn out to be an awful lot more fun when you get stuck into it. Although any modeler will tell you, painting eyes is the most difficult part of it you have ever imagined, and I always try and steer clear from it. And there we are. A little bit of mud to make him sit in the world, and we'll attach him into the model. With a set of tweezers and some glue, our model finds his final home in his diorama. I hope you guys enjoyed this. And in the words of Robert Frost, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Thank you so much Science Week for following this video. I really, really appreciate all the support. If you want to follow me more, you can catch me on social media. I'm on Facebook, you can, I've got a channel on YouTube, and I've got Instagram. All the links should be down below. I really appreciate you following me, guys. I really appreciate you watching this video, and have a great Science Week.
Bye, guys. Thank you. That was uh, really cool. I was like so chilled watching that. Apart from me trying to tweet at the same time, but it was still really chill. It was really popping my head. I hope everyone enjoyed the music as well while working with that. But thanks again. And I think there was a lot of questions. Um, uh, wasn't there, Jeffrey? So I'm I'm just gonna go through them. Um, uh, but uh, but yeah. Thanks again. That was like really cool. Um, so Jeffrey, you said, what is that thing? What do you mean, what is that thing? That was like the very first question. <laughs> oh, I no, 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 the very was, first question. Uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, you, you, you asked someone to be for something. All yeah. right. Hold on. Before that, you did say, when did you first read the poem? That was the very first question. Maybe answer okay. that one first. Um, so I did my leaving cert in 2011. And on that, when we were studying for that, um, I went to boarding school up in Dundalk. So we basically lived and breathed our leaving cert, which is... I should have done much better on it, but anyway. Um, so we for our English class we had to do poems, and in that we did the work of Robert Frost. And I always remember reading the poem, "The, the Road Not Taken." And um, I'd obviously gone through an awful lot of stuff when I was in school. I, I've moved out of home. I moved in with my grandparents, so there was an awful lot there, and it really reminded me of kind of key points in my life where I've had to make choices, and there's a breaking the road and sometimes you have to make a hard choice or sometimes you have to make an easy choice and it's never often a good choice and it really stuck with me and a couple of months ago I was thinking about what to make next and I was reading that poem again um, and I decided hey you know I'm going to stick that in I'm going to make something around that and make it much more personable yeah, anyone can make just a normal diorama but this ties it together into the world and into the poem and makes it more special not just for me but hopefully the people who admire Robert Frost cool. Okay, now for that question was, what is that thing? <laughs> I think I was referring to the, the hand vice, which someone later educated me in the chat. Hand vice? Uh, it's the thing that was holding the, the miniatures. Oh. Is it a hand vice or what would you call this it? This bad boy. Yeah. 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 Um, a shout out to the Irish uh, Model Soldier Society. Um, but three or four years ago, they brought me when well, I went. I went. I went down to their show in the Hilton, and they had all these different models. And I was only really getting into modeling. And they had one of these, and it was sold by this lovely English man. And I bought it. And then a couple of months ago, I decided to kind of beef it up a bit. So I added some new feet, add a little holder here, added some kind of, you know, self-aggrandizement, and kind of repainted it up. But it's been a great little tool that I got. It's got a couple of years ago, and just with a little bit of what, love, I use it every time. What are they called again? Um, it's basically a model holder. So you've model got holder. little, you got little dials here, and essentially what happens is you can push it open, and then you can place a model in it. You then tighten it up, and it closes it, and it holds it. So if you're painting for ages, you don't actually want to be holding the model that you're painting. So you stick it on this, you have it here, and then you can just paint away, and you can turn it, and you can flip it upside down, and you don't have to worry about dropping it or messing it up. Okay. Uh... Uh, let me see. I'm scrolling, scrolling down to live chat. Okay, uh, Jelly Labs Dublin. How long do you have to work with the sculpting material before it dries or sets? So ideally, under ideal circumstances, it should dry within about 30, 30 minutes to about two hours, if you've got the ratio right. And if you remember in my video, I pointed out that you don't want to mess up the ratio. And that's when I tell you that I 100% messed up my ratio. So I put in a bit too much water. So it took, gosh, it took my diorama overnight to dry. And the next morning it was still a little bit wet because I obviously I built this over about two days due to kind of drying issues. And these things take <laughs> a fair bit of time. Um, so yeah, if you do it right and you kind of mix it correctly, it should only take about an hour or so. But the next morning it was still a little bit wet, but the surface was dry enough to work on. And I just kind of plowed on anyway. So about 30 minutes to two hours if you don't muck it up. And if you do muck it up like me, just leave it overnight and you should be fine. Um, oh, I think Maya was mentioning about, um, I think uh, earlier on the video you were using, um, you're were, you were filing down the, the sticks, wasn't it? I think. Oh, barbecue um, sticks, yeah. yeah. She was saying mm -hmm. ma manicure sticks are good too, stiffer than the barbecue ones. Uh, that was just a comment there. 
And um, another one from Jeffrey. Uh, why did you cook the leaves? Uh, so the obvious reason is is that there's biological matter in leaves, <laughs> in that leaves are alive and dirt is alive. And, you know, so what, when I obviously I had all the soil and I, you know, I collected it on the river walk down here in Chapel Lizard and I collected all my soil and I collected all my leaves um, and then I sifted them first. Um, so that was to get rid of any of the obvious, you know, um, biological particles. So you're talking about, not to be gross, but you're talking about bugs and eggs and, and kind of any sort of matter that you don't want. What you want is, is you want the pure, the pure soil. So sifted it, sifted it again, sifted it a third time. And then I baked it and the baking basically nukes anything. So, you know, unless you're, you know, you're unbelievable, you're not going to survive being nuked in the, um, the oven. So it basically kills anything. And then when you lay it down, we then put the scenic glue on top of that, which is a mix of Mod Podge, water and dish soap. Um, it's, it's pretty well known in the hobby community. It, it, it works great. So it, it's basically you have an underlayer and the scenic glue soaks down and meets the underlayer of glue and basically holds everything in place. So although we have the soil on the model, um, that's actually got a layer of glue between it and the world. A very, very small amount of glue. So, you know, from what I've read and I've talked to other modelers about this, it's, this is not going to break down long term. And um, they say that the earth or the soil can maybe slightly change color over a while, but I think that would just add to it. Um, so that's why um, I'm sure you could go without it. But, you know, when I was trying to convince my, um, my girlfriend, um, listen, can I put a bunch of soil and some leaves in the <laughs> oven? You know, my answer was not, yeah, sure. Crafty Nathan, that's totally fine. <laughs> it was very much like, fine <laughs> but uh she, she let me do it in the end and it, you know it came out great and i'll definitely use that that tip again because there's nothing quite as good as real soil and um, i've seen people use other things i've used other things and now that i've used real soil in the sifted way it takes maybe an hour or two to get it where you need to be because you have to sift it and then you need the two different grades so you needed we obviously put a second grade on that which is much kind of thicker stuff so that obviously was stuff that was separated and probably the second sieving so we're kind of separating out all of our different grades of soil and then we're using it but i wouldn't go back to using anything else um yeah, so yeah. that kind of reminded me of my uh my father-in-law um he used to do kind of the uh he used to be an architect so he built all these models and he found these pine cones and they make great kind of trees or some i don't know he was using he wanted to use the pine cones he was walking along and found them and uh it was a lot obviously a long time ago he kind of uh, learned from that and he told us this story and he he was looks fine when everything was all glued together and put and it was great until the following day all the wee bugs and stuff came out because of the pine cone there's lots of creepy things in it yeah. right but that's probably one reason I know like uh, but the other question I had in mind when you're talking about why did you add this uh, dish soap to the mixture um with the uh, glue and water so yeah it's a great question. And it's the question I asked when people were explaining this to me, because most of these techniques, they're not mine. This is stuff that's inherited like any hobby, you know, learn from other people. But the idea is, is that, or so the legend goes from the modeling gods, is that the dish soap is designed to break up the surface tension of the water. And um, so when it gets down onto it, it can seep in an awful lot easier. So what all other people do is that before they apply scenic glue, they put on, they spritz on a layer of isopropyl alcohol to break up that. Mm -hmm. And then that soaks in and then they hit it with the scenic glue, which breaks up the surface tension of the isopropyl alcohol and it soaks right in. So the idea here is that like, if I take the diorama we have here, you know, it should not all fall to pieces. Mm -hmm. It's, it's fairly secure and there's layers of glue holding it together that dries up and you don't see it. But if you didn't have that, the whole thing would just fall apart at the first instance. Okay, cool. Oh, and uh, just to add to that, uh, Sonia said um, that baking was dry, answering Jeffrey about the baking was so they don't go moldy as well. Those... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> um, another one, uh, Fab Lab, Maker Hub, uh, where do you get your modeling supplies from? Uh, so it's a great question. Um, I kind of pick things up from all sorts of different places. So I guess it, I guess I'll go with the, the top things. So for 
my miniatures and for most of my hovering supplies, I pick an awful lot of that stuff from Mark's models. Um, I deal with Simon in there. They're very, very good to me. And I, I enjoy doing business with Shopping Irish. Um, for tools and that, um, I use an awful lot of tools that I bought from local supply stores. I, I, I do get some stuff from Amazon and I, I kind of, it depends on what, what I'm looking for. So like the balsa wood, I picked up uh, before from different places the two miniatures i had from a previous idea of a build i started a couple of years ago but never finished the grass i got from mark's models the earth obviously i picked up and the foam i got from tog hacker space off jerry who's he's got it this is actually great so jerry has this enormous um not jerry gary has this enormous um anvil and forge and everything in the back of tog and he's got this massive piece of um, insulation foam. So I kind of had to scurry in over and kind of hijack things uh, from behind this forge and eventually just cut off a bit. So when lockdown ends and Gary gets back in there, he's going to notice that there's a massive chunk taken out of his <laughs> insulation foam. And that'll be a fun conversation to have with him, <laughs> especially when he's got a forge. <laughs> I can make a model. He can make a sword. <laughs> Oh, cool. Um, so the next question is, um, oh, this is going to be a good one. We were just talking about this before we started. Uh, from Aoife, what's the next diorama you have planned? Right, yeah. So I, I've got two dioramas in the works. Um, I, I tend to work when I'm building projects. I tend to work definitely, people are generally aware of, I'm working on this and I'm also going to start working on this. But for an awful lot of my bills, not including this one, but for more complex stuff, I, I tend to order an awful lot of parts. So if I'm doing kind of electronics and stuff, I tend to order from, let's say, AliExpress or some Chinese wholesalers because I can get a large amount of stuff for, for relatively cheaply. Um, although if anyone knows any good Irish uh, sellers of LEDs and stuff, hit me up because I'm definitely looking for Maker some micro LEDs. Shop. Makershop.ie makershop.e i'm gonna hit them up later on today <laughs> but uh, essentially what i'm working on i'm working on two dioramas now i'm kind of moving away from the kind of the natural stuff that i did for this one and then my last one and i'm working on a space themed one so hopefully everyone here has been watching the mandalorian and they're absolutely loving seeing boba fett again um i know i was like i just lost my mind <laughs> i was sitting here like yes i was like oh. <laughs> <laughs> but um I, I picked up a Mark's model sent me out Slave 1, Boba Fett's and Django Fett's ship. So I have that and I've ordered three TIE fighters. And I've basically got an asteroid field, Slave 1, and three TIE fighters. One TIE fighter could put, gone right into the side of an asteroid. And the idea will be is that it's all going to be individually wired. So I've got some basically LED filaments that are basically like little, uh, kind of like a, like a much smaller version of this, maybe a third of the size. And they basically light up like a blaster bolt. So you're going to have those kind of blaster bolts, those red blaster bolts coming off Slave 1, and you're going to have the lights flaring and the engines going mad, and it's going to be this whole thing. So that's the first one. We've got all the bits, and we're probably going to start filming that this weekend. And the second build is a Warhammer 40K build, um, which is basically going to be the inside of a mechanicus structure. There's going to be motors. There's going to be fans turning. There's going to be the, the sirens. There's going to be doors going up and down. And the idea will be is to really show off kind of what you can do with motors and turning a diorama from just a snapshot in history to being a moment of something moving and like a, an actual machinery being alive. Um, so that's going to take a bit longer. I, I've ordered a pile of parts, um, a lot of motors, a lot of, a lot, a lot of kind of regulators and stuff. And I'd imagine Jeffrey is going to be plagued over the next couple of weeks of me asking him, "How do I make a screen from a Nokia three ten turn into a cool Mechanicus picture?" And he, <laughs> he'll probably be like, "Well, Nathan, that's never been done before, and we'll, we'll try and figure it out." So those are my two big plans at the moment. Oh, cool. uh, so that will be next question is. What would you use to do different types of trees like oak or chestnuts? Um, th th yours, this, this is just one way of doing trees and there's so many different ways of doing trees. So I, I've experimented with this way and I've experimented with another way and I'm kind of a familiar with some other ideas. So what an awful lot of other people do and a really great way of starting in on trees is if you make a wire tree. Um, so you need some craft wire. You can pick that up just about anywhere. And you basically create strands and strands of wire and roll them up. And when you have that, then you can 
you've created your trunk and then you can break off those wires and twirl them up. So you're basically creating branches and you've got the leaves and the foliage effect and you can cover that in. Uh, I've seen people use latex and it looks absolutely horrifying. It's basically a tree with skin, um, <laughs> which is exactly what it sounds like, but you can paint over it. It looks fine. But if you don't paint over it, it, it absolutely looks terrifying. Um, but an awful lot of people, they'll put clay on it or they'll put a bit of um, green stuff on it. And they'll basically then carve in the look of the tree. Um, that's that's another way of doing it. I've seen it. It works quite well. It's um, finicky and, and it's, it's a much easier way of doing it. This was fine. These trees were really, really fun to do. Um, they just take forever because you have to drive in that those pieces of craft wire right into the balsa wood. And balsa wood obviously will, will, you can drive anything into balsa wood, but it's just time and you're trying to put in rows and rows of them. And I had what, seven trees. So you can imagine that probably that took the guts of maybe 10 hours of just sitting there and driving stuff in and cutting wire. And it was a bit of a nightmare. So definitely try wire trees or some people that you can buy armatures from companies like Woodland Scenics. They sell armatures. You can uh, plugging Mark's models here, but you can pick it up from there. Or you can pick it up from any reputable hobby store and you've got a tree and you can just paint it and then you can flock it, which is, you know, the act of putting, you know, um, vegetation, the idea of flocking onto something. And um, those would be the two, two or three good ways of doing it. Oh, oh, I think uh, uh, Mark from Jelly Labs just made just said there, I think that was the part where you cut your fingers, wasn't it? The comment you made. Uh, but, uh, you were saying, I was wondering if we could all chip in to buy Nathan a pair of gloves. I suspect gloves would make some of the detail work difficult, though, uh, which is why you don't wear them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh, okay so so um my girlfriend is in the other room and she's probably going to tear in here when i say that yeah i 100 cut my hands to shreds on this thing. um yeah i i'm a bit weird uh, personally um i've always been like this but I, I don't like anything anywhere near my hands i don't like anything near my hands or my forearms if anyone has seen me at any point in my life they'll see that i have my sleeves rolled up and i, I don't cover my forearms so you, can't, um, you can't feel anything, isn't it? It's touch, it's all touch, isn't it? If you're working on yeah, small detail uh, stuff. But it's just, I, I've always been this way. Like uh, I, I will always, I, if I'm wearing a jacket, I'll roll it up. I, I just, I find it really, really constricting. And when I'm oh. working on a model or something, I, I just, I need that kind of dexterity to kind of work with something. Um, I try to be as careful as I possibly can. And you, you definitely need to be careful. Like I've cut myself, unfortunately, with some sharp scalpels before. I took off the oh. top of my thumb before. Um, and the big thing I will say to people is, is the times when you cut yourself is not the times when you're paying attention. It's never those times. Uh, th that's never the conversation we're having. It's always the times when you think everything is safe and you don't have to worry about it. That's when actually you're, you're going to do the damage to yourself. When you know there's a very real danger. So if I have a knife out or if I'm working in tog with a laser cutter or something mental like that, um, I know not to muck around. I, I'm giving it attention. But like, for an example, when you're taking off, pulling off the last bit of the lid of that thing, you think there is no danger. My hands are, but one switch. And then I, you know, it was only surface level and it was fine. But you, that's when you're going to do damage. So, you know. I hear, yeah, I think it's patience. You kind of, I know you're very careful, but then, you know, right at the end, you just, as you say, you just twist it off. It's just because, ah, sure, we're nearly there. And exactly. it's that one moment of, uh, you know, it's when you I, think you're the safest yeah. is when you're going to do the damage, which is, which is kind of, it's par for the course. I mean, hobbying, you're very unlikely to really hurt yourself, but if you're a bit younger, you know, some of the scalpels you can buy, I know uh, Evans art supply store where I pick up some stuff. They have surgical scalpels. Yeah. I mean, those are amazing there. scalpels though. They're the best ones. They're, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're the best, but you, you know, you don't want to, um, you know what I mean? Like you, you nip yourself yeah. with them, you know, that is, you can really, yeah. really hurt yourself. So it's I all used, just, yeah, it's, it, I used, first used them when I was like in secondary school in my art class, they were like the best things ever. So when I got a chance, I tried so many different scalpel knives. So those are still the best ones, but they are super sharp. And they're all mm. called surgical knives for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got another question here um, sure. from Killian. Uh, where do you get most of your ideas? What's your inspiration? Um, so I, I, that, that's a bit of a hard question. I don't really know. Like, like generally what will happen is, is I'll see something, um, a bit random and I'll just kind of run at it. So like, 
I what was his name? Um, Adam Savage made a video there a couple of months ago on uh, he made a soldering station. I thought that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. I think that's that's deadly. And I put that in my mind. And then I was on adverts about four or five months ago and I was scrolling through um, stuck in lockdown. And I noticed someone was selling a British Army artillery case, a massive trashed case. And my brain just kind of went, you should put a soldering station in that. That would be dope. And then I was kind of like, that's a great idea, Nathan. Good job, Nathan. Kind of pat myself on the head. And I went off and bought it. (laughs) And then I kind of went off and I ran on that. So it's kind of just ideas that kind of pop into my head. And some, uh, my girlfriend has suggested quite a few. I don't know if anyone is, if anyone's following me, they've seen my kind of book nooks. My girlfriend suggested that and kind of on George and Dublin and people seem to be really into that. So sometimes people suggest ideas to me sometimes i just have ideas myself it's kind of a combination um but i i love it when people give me ideas like some people have really really great ideas some people have terrible ideas but, but uh, i definitely listen to all of them yeah people should check out the videos um um uh, on your youtube channel and also your updates on instagram because um that that uh soldering station was just uh was just amazing and you're still working on it because you're still you're using it you're still tweaking and stuff so it's pretty check check it out uh got another question it's one from sean uh what's the best way to display a diorama in your home that was my question to you earlier on with all your cool (laughs) stuff that you're making (laughs) um i'm i'm probably the worst person to give an example of this so um i I live in i live in dublin city center i've got a little apartment um and i don't have a huge amount of space so in this room which is kind of my office and my kind of sorry, my making room, I kind of don't really have any space for display. I, I did previously on this wall, but that's since been taken up with um, endless amounts of supplies that I've kind of picked up. So in the sitting room, I've kind of filled up the top of the bookshelves and I have a display case, but that's currently got a massive 40K army of, um, if anyone's into 40K, <laughs> it's, it's Praetorian guards. So it's pith helmets and there's hundreds of them so I, I kind of tend to fill up spaces I don't really know what I'm going to do with these for the moment um I definitely know I, I built a big submarine a few years ago and that's probably going to go into storage and the Boba Fett model the Boba Fett model is probably going to go up on top of my bookshelf um one on the right which makes no sense to you but does to me um and I'll probably stick it up there and I'll look at it every so often and I'll be like yeah Boba Fett <laughs> um and then hopefully when I, hopefully in the days when house prices are more reasonable, I'll have a, a better, sp- bigger space to display all my models. It's going to be like uh, Adam Savage. You're going to have a warehouse and all your collections will be in there, right? Yeah. But, no, no, no. Yeah, so he actually like has a whole warehouse, like all the display case, all the amazing. <laughs> the thing is, he gets people sent him all these, like, uh, you know, those, uh, the, the astronaut suits, you know, space suits and all oh. that, all, all, all those cool um, kind of things models of stuff that they send because you know they're just amazing and he just loves them all so i can see that you're gonna slowly will have a room just dedicated just to display that would be really really cool displaying all your stuff yeah, I'm dripping with jealousy every time i see adam savage's cave <laughs> so, you know it's just like yeah i'd love that now i'd love that now. and that and that new workbench is just amazing and we oh, we looked it up it's actually not terribly expensive but you, you just have to put a lot of work in and finding all the materials yeah um because we thought it was going to, yeah, but it was, uh, I think that's uh, kind of most of the questions, I think. Uh, so, and uh, yeah, we're coming, wow, we're coming up just past two. So, Jeffrey, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, there was just uh, one comment here that might be a bit of an inside source about uh, the odor that comes out when you're ovening, putting dirt into your oven. I mean, have you got any comments about what's it like <laughs> in your kitchen when you're putting leaves and dirt into your oven? So I don't know who sent that comment. <laughs> I'm not suggesting. I'm not saying I'm talking to you right now. <laughs> but I know and I'm really sorry. <laughs> and 100% that will stink out your house. And, it, you know, I, I tried to play it off because I'll tell you what happened. So we brought it home. And when I would convinced my girlfriend that, yes, we're going to put these things in the oven. And she was kind of like, fine. Um, I then put them in the oven and st- stood there kind of very triumphantly and was like, <laughs> yes, I am the master modeler. Look upon everything that I have conquered. And then th- the whiff slowly hit me, kind of breathing it in. And she turns to me. I love this woman to bits, but I've never seen her look at me look quite like this. And she looked at me and she was like, what's that smell? And I was like, I'm bringing the taste of the country inside. <laughs> 
did not find that funny. <laughs> so, uh, no, uh, there is a... <laughs> I was in the doghouse there for a while, but um, yeah, definitely. If you if you bake that stuff inside, you are going to get it. No, it's not awful, but it is an earthy. It's, it's exactly how you imagine. I'll it. say Just... you have some um, citrus peel and some baking. What was it? Uh, you can like uh, baking powder and stuff ready to put in the oven to get rid of, naturally get rid of the the stinky smell, you know, as well. Because uh, it makes That's a nice citrus. Idea. Just don't burn your citrus peels. Just you know, b- bake it at really low heat. Just to get the aroma going, that will at least neutralize it. The baking soda will neutralize it, and the citrus just gives it a nice citrusy flavor. So for so uh, that's because I uh, yeah that was just experience, not because of soil. It's just because you know cleaning the oven with chemicals that make awful smells. And mm. I thought the whole place was gonna blow up because of these chemical fumes. So I found natural way to deodorize everything and make it smell mm. because I wasn't gonna use that oven ever again. <laughs> Mickey, did we just go MythBusters full circle there? <laughs> <laughs> I think we did. I think we did. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I think um, we're going to wrap this up uh, because it's like, um, yeah, it's like six minutes past now. Uh, so thank you to everyone who joined us this session. And I hope people um, get a chance to go around and make your own dioramas. Do share with us. Um, share, share with Crafty Nathan. You're on like um, you're, you're on Instagram. You're on Facebook. You're on Twitter. You have your own YouTube channel, which is amazing. Go people go check it. Um but um, uh, so big thanks to you for putting all that together and staying with us, answering all the questions. And uh, um, of course, just a quick saying, quick uh, thanks to um, uh, uh, Science Week and SFI who uh, who who um, who run Science Week and also fund Double Maker. Um, but I'm gonna leave. The, the, um, I'm gonna. Do you have any shout outs you wanna um, to tell people about? I know you talked about your upcoming dioramas and stuff like that. But do you have any other shout outs or kind of future things that people should look out for? And also remember to subscribe and like all your stuff. Yes, we'll, we'll definitely like or subscribe all my stuff. That would be greatly appreciated. Um, I guess a shout out straight away to Tog Hackerspace for all their help there. Those guys are absolutely terrific, except Jeff. But all the rest of them are absolutely great and they'll do so much work for you. There should be a video coming out hopefully this weekend on my um, soldering station. A bit more of an update on what it was last time. Um, we're going to kind of show some of the fun things. There, there might be some shots of the TIE fighters in there. There's three TIE fighters sitting on my bench here. So hopefully we'll get some stuff on that. Um, you can find me on most social media. Um, I guess in the future, you're going to see some more dioramas while we're still in lockdown. And then hopefully if we get a vaccine for COVID and we kind of exit this void that we found ourselves in, um, I'll probably get back to some big conventions. There's a massive tech priest project I've been working on. Jeff knows all about it. He trips over it every so often because it takes up half the workshop. Um, But that'll be, that'll be hopefully rolling out once we can go to a convention. And then I just want to thank you everyone that follows. Uh, Thank you, Dublin Maker. And thank you to my ever suffering girlfriend who puts up with the toxic smell of earth in our apartment all right okay what i'm gonna do now i'm gonna say bye to you and i'm just gonna switch over to myself to talk about tomorrow's session so thanks again nathan and thanks jeff have a good day um so thanks again to nathan and to everyone who joined us so tomorrow we're gonna have two events we're gonna have megan scott and art an artist at chester Beatty who'll do We'll be showing people how to make your own DIY steampunk plate doctor mask. Very relevant to nowadays. And then at one o'clock, um, we have uh, James Clifford from Made by Cliff, uh, for, um, who will show you how to build your own ergonomic folding laptop stand. So great for people who are working from home. And uh, it might be a cheaper way than um, than buying something online. But you should buy because there's lots of cool local places doing, you know, selling rough for home furniture and stuff. But uh, yeah, come come along and join us tomorrow from 12. We're live streaming. Um, so don't forget to uh, go to, uh, to subscribe, like subscribe um, to our YouTube channel and hit that notification bell to know when our things go live. And I've added a URL this time around just so for people who want to get a shot, see where the shopping list is of the various kind of um, workshops and demos and stuff. So um, this is me signing up, Vicky uh, from Double Maker, and I'll see you uh, tomorrow at 12 o'clock. Bye.